Hey everybody, this is Derek, um, the category manager for vitamins, minerals, and herbs over here at LuckyVitamin.com. It's great to have so many people joining us today for the Lucky Vitamin Wellness Webinar, Stocking Your Natural Medicine Cabinet, presented by Nature's Way. Thank you all very much for attending. Today we're going to hear from Dr. Don Brown. Dr. Donald Brown is one of the leading authorities in the USA on the safety and efficacy of dietary supplements evidence-based herbal medicine, and probiotics. Dr. Brown currently serves as the Director of Natural Product Research Consultants in Seattle, Washington. He's the author of Herbal Prescriptions for Health and Healing and was also a contributor to the Natural Pharmacy, the A to Z Guide to Drug, Herb, Vitamin Interactions, and also the Textbook of Natural Medicine. Before I turn things over to Dr. Brown, just a few quick reminders. This webinar is being recorded and will be emailed to you after its conclusion. If you have any questions during today's webinar, please enter them into the question box on your screen. At the end of the webinar, we will try to answer as many questions as possible. The promotion code will be given at the end of the presentation and will be available for 72 hours. Thank you all again, and I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Donald Brown now. Thank you, Derek. It's a pleasure to be on, and I uh, would like to um, uh, say thank you to the uh, people at uh, Lucky Vitamin, and uh, welcome to everybody who's on the webinar. We're going to spend uh, uh, about a half an hour today talking about a couple of strategies that, uh, as we approach cold and flu season, uh, many people would argue we're already into it. I was on an airplane today, and lots of people were coughing and complaining about sore throats, and not feeling good, so it looks like we may even be right in the middle of it. But um, we're going to talk about a couple of strategies. Yes? Uh, we can't see your screen. Can you accept it so we can see it? I, you can't see it at all? No, it's not coming up. So share my webcam. Now, let us just re-switch it over to you. Sorry, guys. Okay. Yeah. You should be getting an invitation to be the presenter right now. And just show my like show my screen. Yeah, that didn't that didn't come up before. Sorry. Great. Okay, Thanks. let's, go let's ahead. see. Can, can you see it now? Okay, good. Yeah. And I'll get the go to, go to webinar control panel out of the way too. Here. All right, good. No, I don't want to leave the I don't want to leave the webinar. Uh, <laughs> we can't see the control panel. Good. Okay, I can. Unfortunately, it's blocking my my view. Okay, we're back to the beginning. <laughs> Welcome everyone, and thank you for joining the. Uh, the webinar today, and as I was saying before, I so rudely didn't show my uh, my screen here. Uh, we're going to spend about a half an hour today talking about a couple of strategies for stocking your what I'm calling natural medicine cabinet for the cold and flu season, uh, whether for yourself or your, for your family. Um, a couple of really simple strategies to have around that are really useful, and not only useful but also clinically proven strategies to be able to uh, reduce the severity and incidence of, of, of the common cold, acute bronchitis, and we'll also talk about the flu as well. We're going to start by, by just, let me introduce it, just a couple of, um, uh, concept, uh, just to uh, go over a couple of concepts here. One is just to set up the actual cost of upper respiratory tract infections in our countries and stating the fact that Americans suffer about an estimated 1 billion colds per year. Uh, symptoms of the cold and flu actually account for more office visits to particularly primary care physicians, pediatricians than, than any other cause. Uh, we look at uh, lost school days with children, which translates into lost uh, days of work many times for parents, about 22 million school days lost annually. And the estimated cost of loss of pro productivity, particularly in the workplace due to cough and cold, is about $9 billion annually. And I think the, probably the, the really startling number here is the fact that uh, Americans spend close to $3 billion on over-the-counter cough and cold medications. 
And what's interesting with those is even though they may provide some brief symptomatic relief, they're really sort of masking the symptoms in many cases. And, and, and as we'll note in the later slide, uh, certainly concerns with, with children um, taking these types of medicines. If we, go, we look at the upper respiratory tract uh, infection arena, um, what's really interesting here is, is that if we think back, um, old people like me think back 20, 25 years ago, most primary care doctors were treating uh, bronchitis with antibiotics. It was almost an automatic. And about 15 years ago, there started to be a movement um, in the medical community that was saying, hey, we're finding out that acute bronchitis is largely viral. And really, the numbers now are with the fact that acute bronchitis is only about 90% viral and using and, and not due to bacterial infections. And using antibiotics is really unnecessary and, uh, and, 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 and probably causing more harm than good um, in that. And interestingly, acute sinusitis has recently been added as well. Uh, while their estimates are about 70% of acute sinusitis is, is, is um, uh, possibly viral, maybe even more. Um, basically, what they're finding is, is that the beginning is usually viral. And so the recommendation is, is for about 7 to 10 days of actually supportive treatment. And uh, we're going to talk later about a root uh, plant, a uh, plant uh, that we use the root called Pelargonium sedoides. It has a lot of research and it has a large study on, on sinusitis and would be a classic example of something that we would want to try to try before using using antibiotics. And then there's always that difficult topic, particularly as we talk about kids with tonsillitis, uh, remembering that only about 10% of adult tonsillitis is caused by strep, or actually a strep throat. Um, only 30% of children, so higher in children. And I don't want to minimize that because uh, strep throat in children is dangerous, and it is a, 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 a something that should be treated with antibiotics. However, um, acute non-strep, if a child's tested for strep and it comes back negative, um, really the approach is to use supportive care. And we're, again, we're going to talk about a South African route that, that has uh, some nice data in that area as well. So pediatric over-the-counter options are limited. As a matter of fact, limited um, because there's been a large advocacy group, not only in this country, but also in Canada, that have approached the FDA, Health Canada, and have said, hey, we think that over-the-counter cough and cold medications are actually dangerous for children, and we have data to prove it. And in fact, um, in October of 2008, drug makers agreed to stop marketing these particular drugs to children under the age of four. Interestingly, the advocacy group wanted that to be below the age of six, and actually Canada set the bar at six years of age and below. So when we think about the fact that children have more of these upper respiratory tract infections, uh, bronchitis, common cold uh, than adults, this is really, uh, I think, relevant when we talk about alternative therapies and things that we can have um, in, in the medicine cabinet. So let's talk about our first uh, uh, medicine cabinet ingredient that we're going to, uh, to feature, Pelargonium sedoides. And, and I, I say this is a safe and effective alternative for the treatment of upper respiratory tract infections. Later on, I'll give you a little bit of idea of why I say that with regards to the amount of research that's been done on this particular plant extract. Um, a little bit of background on Pelargonium sedoides. It's actually a member of the geranium family. It has these beautiful purple flowers, and it's native to, to South Africa and most commonly found in the grasslands. And the medicinal preparations uh, typically and, 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 and in modern times with the researched um, extract actually use the root of the plant. It has a really interesting sort of a history if you look at traditional Zulu healing um, in, in, in South Africa. Very, very common to use this for really what we would consider and, and call, they don't call it that, but we, what we would consider it to be things like bronchitis. Um, interestingly, it was popularized in Western culture, a, a fellow named Charles Stevens, who must have been a, a, a British man of, of, of means, went to his doctor and was diagnosed with what at that time was called consumption. Consumption is now known as tuberculosis. And he was he came over to South Africa for some R&R, &R, was treated by a, a, a Zulu healer with the root of Pelargonium sedoides and actually was cured. And so he, being the uh, entrepreneurial type that he was, brought the route back with him. I don't know how he had other people bringing it over or he had uh, ships bringing it over to him. But he actually created something in Great Britain called Stevens Consumption Cure. And uh, this had a run of about 
five or six years until the British equivalent of the FDA at that point, I don't know what it was called, basically said that uh, published a treatise on, on, on quackery and, and, and Stevens Consumption Cure unfortunately made the short list. So it went away. So we have really a, 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 quite a number of years, almost a, a hundred years went by. And uh, some German researchers, uh, plant medicine researchers, actually were looking at different cultural uses of different plant medicines that had not been introduced um, in, 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 a, you know, in a way, in a modern way, into, into Western uh, herbal medicine. And they discovered and looked at the Pelargonium sedoides root based on this historical use and actually were able to identify some of the active constituents in the, in the root and over a period of about seven or eight years actually developed a proprietary extract um, that, that came out. This particular extract, by the way, um, if you are the types that go in and look at the research that's been done is actually referred to as EPS 7630, extract of Pelargonium sedoides uh, 7630. And this is really the researched form of this particular, particular root. Before we get to the research that's been done, uh, some of the, the mechanisms of action, I think it's really fascinating that have been identified for this particular plant medicine, this root um, extract, is the fact that we, we want active immune support. So this is really a, when, when we talk about it, this is really a plant medicine that's kept in the medicine cabinet and is best used at the onset of a upper respiratory tract infection. So you start to feel symptoms of the common cold, uh, acute bronchitis at the beginning. It's typically taken for about seven to 10 days once the, once the uh, symptoms have resolved. People are usually encouraged to stop it at that point. So it's used in more of an acute sort of a situation. Situationally is what I'm, I'm, I'm trying to say for, for this. So the actions all sort of overlap, but um, immune support is very, very important. And really immune stimulation is one of the things that we see with this particular route. Um, also the fact that it, it, this, the blue balloon here is, is, is a little bit off because really what we're talking about is preventing viral spread. Obviously once you start to have an upper respiratory tract infection, you've already got a viral infection. But one of the things that makes a viral infection uh, get worse is the spread of the virus. And uh, one of the things that this is doing is preventing that spread. And last but not least, it's also preventing bacterial adhesion. Remember that when we get congested and we get a lot of, lot of mucus buildup, um, that, that really is a ripe environment for then secondary bacterial infections to come in as well. And this is another action um, that the Pelargonium sedoides root extract actually demonstrates. And up on the corner is that little gray balloon. This is sort of a newer finding with regards to the Pelargonium sedoides extract is the fact that you have these little hair-like structures in your respiratory tract that are really sort of supposed to be sweeping all the time and helping to sweep things out of the respiratory tract and keep the respiratory tract clear of, of, of mucus and things building up. And one of the things that oftentimes happens in an upper respiratory tract infection, a viral upper respiratory tract infection, is that the cilia become kind of paralyzed and that 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 also contributes to a lot of the congestion that we see uh, in the bronchial area um, and, and so forth. And so one of the things that the Pelargonium sedoides root extract does is it actually helps keep that sweeping action going, keeps the cilia active. And I hate to use the word expectorant, but it's, it's probably the easiest term for people to understand. So it really is sort of contributing to getting that stuff out that has a tendency to want to build up. Um, so we have multiple mechanisms of action for this particular uh, plant extract. And the thing that really gets me excited, I'm, I'm sort of an evidence-based guy. I like to see data that not only talks about the, the efficacy or the effectiveness of the, of the substance in question, but is it safe? And that would be the other part of it, too. And um, we can really check both of those things off the list with, with this particular plant medicine. Over 20 studies have been completed to date and with over 9,000 participants. What's really interesting, if you dig into the, the, the ratio of adults to children, this is really a plant extract that has a lot of research um, in the pediatric arena. Um, of that 9,000, about 3,800 have been children uh, to date, children ranging all the way down to the age of one in some of the uh, clinical trials. But uh, a, a lot of research in children. And research indications include the common cold, 
bronchitis, I would say probably if somebody said, what is it best proved for? Acute bronchitis is probably its strongest, and it's interesting that in Germany, this particular extract became very, very popular because pediatricians were recommending it based on its safety profile for children and getting really great results for acute bronchitis. And uh, so I would say acute bronchitis is probably the area where there's the most data, but we have a very good study on common cold that, that we'll look at. Um, tonsillitis, and again, this is non-strep tonsillitis um, in, in children has been studied, and also a, another study with sinusitis. Um, the common cold study, bronchitis, tonsillitis studies were all in that seven to 10 day range. The sinusitis study was a little bit of an outlier. They actually uh, treated people for about 23 days in that particular study and used a little bit higher dose of, of the uh, plant extract. Okay, acute bronchitis, as I said, is probably the area where it has the most amount of, of uh, uh, data. Uh, a meta-analysis in, in the research world is where we pool data on different studies on a single ingredient. And uh, what we do is we create a, it's almost like a cheesecloth, where we pour the studies through the cheesecloth. Some of the studies don't make it through. They might be too small. They might not be placebo controlled. Um, they, they might not be designed correctly. And so experts actually create the screen. And the ones that make it through, there's actually a pooled, uh, they pool the data and say, hey, do we, are we seeing a consistent effect from study to study? This was, this was actually published in 2008. This came out of uh, England. Uh, Dr. Edzard Ernst is one of the uh, uh, phytomedicinal or, or plant medicine experts in the world. And he and his group did a meta-analysis um, and at that point found that there were six high-quality randomized clinical trials, that means that they were placebo controlled, which is sort of a gold standard in, in the research area, that suggests there's encouraging evidence that pelargonium pseudoides is effective compared to placebo for patients with acute bronchitis. And again, some of these studies that were in here were actually pediatric studies as well. I can tell you that there have been, since this 2008 meta-analysis, there have been another three clinical trials, two of them actually being pediatric uh, trials with acute bronchitis. So a lot of data in this area, and I think it's really in our, in our natural armament one of the better uh, products available for both kids and adults. Okay, let's switch to the common cold. And um, as I said, there was a nice study that was published in 2007, a nice, nice size study that was also a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial. Uh, these were adults ages 18 to 55. And this is fairly typical of the way that this plant extract has been studied. Basically, people are within the first two days of symptoms. I say do it even sooner than that if possible. But most of the studies have got started giving it to people within the first 48 hours, and then they take it for about 7 to 10 days. In this case, it was a 10-day study, and you can see the adult uh, dose was 1.5 mLs. They used a, basically a standard cold intensity uh, score, uh, which assesses things like nasal, nasal discharge, sore throat, minor symptoms, all the ones that we're familiar with with, with the common cold. And what they found was is that after 10 days, almost 80% of the pelargonium pseudoides extract group were, were clinically cured, which means they were essentially over the cold, compared to only 31.4% of the placebo group. And for those of you who follow statistics, the, the, the p-value there is quite statistically significant. That's a, it's a very st statistically uh, significant. And, and the fun part about this study, and they've done it in other ones, is also to look at, hey, when did people, did people actually get back to work when we talked about the productivity earlier? And in fact, in this study, people did get back to work quicker um, in, the, in the group that was taking the pelargonium pseudoides. And one of the things I really like about this, and again, this is an adult study, but we also see it in the pediatric studies, side effects are extremely rare and, 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 and really non-serious. We'll talk a little, a little later on another slide about some of the safety with this particular um, extract. And what was interesting is, is that uh, a year later, uh, there is a, uh, a journal, an online journal that goes out to family docs uh, called the Journal of Family Practice. And they actually uh, surprised a bunch of us by doing, I had, had done several reviews on this particular plant extract. They actually did their own analysis of the common cold study that I just um, uh, um, shared with you. And uh, you can see their conclusions here that uh, they think these findings recommend, uh, justify recommending this to our patients and that patients, patients should be advised to purchase the medication to have on hand at the start of the cold, and, uh, cold start of the cold season. I think some of the marketing people at the uh, at the at the company that uh, sells this extract were quite happy with that endorsement. But it was a very positive one. 
Okay, let's, uh, let's talk a little bit about safety and cautions. Again, I can't, I can't put enough emphasis on the fact that this is safe for children. Um, and remember, when you get into really young children, particularly under the age of two, really good to have the pediatrician involved um, in, or family doc involved in, in diagnosis. The stakes get a little bit higher sometimes with younger children if they get into particularly bronchitis and tonsillitis and, the, and those sorts of things. Um, this is an ingredient that is not recommended at this time during pregnancy or while nursing. If a woman's nursing, they, they, they shouldn't use it. Um, one of the great things with this product is, is that if somebody does need to take antibiotics, for instance, let's say strep throat, this is an ingredient that actually can be taken along with them. And it's kind of a, I like using it with strep throat because really antibiotics can sometimes take two to three days to kick in. This is really great for taking that sort of, everybody has different descriptions, that sort of sandpapery feeling in the back of the throat or it's like you've chewed broken glass, some people even, you know, in the back of the throat. It really is irritating. Um, and so it won't interact with the antibiotics even though the antibiotics may be necessary if there's strep throat. And again, the, the, the side effects are very, very rare in clinical trials. There's been a few cases of some mild rashes. And, and it, what's interesting is, is those have been a little bit more on the pediatric side, and it's not uncommon sometimes with viral infections for kids to get rashes. Um, to sort of set up this particular um, ingredient and put some context around, uh, if you call the folks at Lucky Vitamin or contact, contact them, this product is sold in the United States under the name of UMKA, U-M-C-K-A by Nature's Way, and uh, has been on the market now for probably about 10 years, and uh, really um, has a wide variety of different ways to take it from alcohol-free cherry-flavored syrups for kids to really more traditional tincture type uh, alcohol-based uh, uh, drops, uh, some PM drinks, that sort of thing. So ask the people at Lucky Vitamin if you're interested in this. It's, it's a really a, quite a wide variety of, of products that are available um, with this particular ingredient. Okay, we're going to switch gears now and move away from sort of the upper respiratory tract infections and talk about another, what's called an, an acute respiratory infection, but really one that manifests itself much differently, and that's the flu. And uh, again, with, you know, we need to put some context around the fact that the flu can be dangerous in certain populations, uh, particularly immunocompromised people. The elderly, oftentimes it's dangerous. So we don't want to minimize um, having people monitored if they get the flu. But for, for many of us who are otherwise healthy, uh, it's going around the family and that sort of thing, um, using something that, like the pelargonium for the common cold or the acute bronchitis, can actually shorten the duration of the flu and shorten the severity of the flu. Um, that's something I think we'd all argue that, and it's natural, doesn't have any side effects, is something that, that we uh, would like to have around in the medicine cabinet. And my favorite, my favorite um, plant for this is actually, it's on the right side of the screen, are the berries of what is called European black elderberry or Sambucus nigra. Um, interestingly, the flowers um, on the left side of the screen, I'll go to the next slide, the flowers were actually the part uh, traditionally that were used uh, oftentimes for uh, colds and, and, and flus and that sort of thing. And uh, um, you go into traditional references and they refer to the elder plant. And they were really using more of the flowers. And it was really, um, in, it really in the, the 70s that a researcher in, in Israel started looking at the berries and found that the berries actually have this very interesting antiviral effect. And a lot of that was very specific to inf the influenza viruses um, that were around. And so she started doing research and, and really proved that, hey, it's the berries that actually have activity. And we'll look at some of that activity um, in a little bit. So really, the, the, the shift has been completely to the berries. I have to say, the first time that I heard about uh, um, elderberry, I got a little bit nervous because my, my grandmother, when I was younger, actually um, had me watch Arsenic and Old Lace. So my orientation to, to elderberry initially was these two spinster sisters who were making elderberry wine and giving it to these poor um, uh, gentlemen who were bachelors and or, 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 or people who had lost their wives and uh, they um, uh, obviously were poisoning the wine. So uh, I was happy when I did some research into the black elderberry that that wasn't the way it was being delivered to people. But um, I thought for those of you who are old enough to remember this movie, you get a kick out of it. It was Cary Grant, I think, was one of the stars and it was quite funny. Frank Capra was the, the director as well. 
Okay, so how does black elderberry work? Um, again, not dissimilar to what we talked about with the pelargonium. Immunomodulatory actions means it's basically increasing production of what are called cytokines or, or immune system cells in the body that are responsible for being sort of a front line of attack when we start to get a viral um, infection. But what's really cool about elderberry is, is that the, it has a couple of antiviral, specific antiviral properties. It, it, it inhibits viral replication. We talked about that with regards to pelargonium the pelargonium sedoides with the common cold and bronchitis. But one of the things it also does is it actually inhibits the ability of viruses to bind to cells. Um, when we talk about viruses, it's often co common to hear about H1, N1. Um, viruses have two spikes. They have a hemagglutinin spike, and then they have a neuraminidase spike. And the hemagglutinin spike is the one that actually adheres to cells and allows the virus to enter the cell. Once it gets in there, the neuraminidase part of the, the virus starts to get active and it, it causes the virus then to replicate in the cell and then start to spread. So even if, in this case sort of a frontline defense um, against the cell, the, the virus actually being able to, to um, bind. Um, a test tube study, that's what an in vitro study is from Germany, um, basically, I almost spent a lot of time on this on this slide, basically found that the um, extract, uh, which is a standardized extract, it was very active in inhibiting the ability of the growth of both uh, common types of, of influenza, influenza A and B are major families in the influenza uh, virus area, it was very active at that. And uh, for a long time, we thought that that black elder was only good for actually using um, symptomatically, as I talked about before. But there is a brand new study out of Australia that, again, you know, looks at a standardized extract um, in airline passengers that were taking long-haul flights. And what they found was is that the incidence of cold and flu, using it preventively, I might add, found that they, they reduced the incidence of cold and flu. But if people got a cold or got the flu, the duration was reduced by about two days in those taking taking black elder elderberry. Brand new study, and, and it'll be nice, fun to see if there's other uh, studies that come out that look at prevention. Certainly the mechanism of action with black elderberry suggests that it may have a preventive effect, which would make it a little bit different in the medicine cabinet. Um, might be something you might want to take on a daily basis um, with regards to the cold and flu season. Again, getting back to the pelargonium we talked about earlier, very, very clear that, that that's a, really a symptomatic um, a treatment and to be used only episodically. Okay, the black elderberry safety is very, very safe. The American Herbal Products Association rates elderberry as a class one herb. Looks like I need to get done to hear they're coming after me. Um, consumption is safe, basically, without any specific use restrictions, and uh, there are no reported side effects. It's really, really a, a very, very uh, safe herb. It's been also, you know, in the in, in the food chain for a long time as well. There are some people that when they take it because of the high tannin content can get a little bit of clenching of the stomach. And uh, we recommend oftentimes with that group to use something like gummies or some of the things that are, are dissolved a little bit slower. Lozenges are available um, as well. And so really no uh, known uh, reasons not to use, for pregnant and lactating women uh, not to use this, and no known uh, confirmed drug interactions. Um, this particular product, um, and when we talk about standardized extracts, probably the best-selling product in the natural uh, supplement space is a product known as Sambucus from Nature's Way. This is an ingredient that uh, I helped them work on for about three or four years to develop where we really wanted to come up with a standardized extract and, and, and make that available and been very, very happy. And again, like the UNCA, for children and adults has really a wide range of, of delivery forms um, that can accommodate different, you know, what people's preferences are. So again, people at Lucky Vitamin can help you out with, with that choice. Okay, I'm going to close by just mentioning, I know there was a probiotic uh, webinar yesterday, but just want to mention the fact that we have a, a, an incredible amount of data that's coming out now um, indicating that probiotics are not only useful for digestive health, but the fact that these little bugs not only influence the gastrointestinal tract, which by the way, about 70% of our, our is in the GI tract, interestingly, but once they bind to cells, they then start communicating with cells that are the communication points inside the body for the immune system, and a, a lot of really, really interesting data coming up, and really data now that's indicating that probiotics actually 
when they're used on a regular basis, one study with kids for six months, another one with adults that was about six months um, in duration right before the cold and flu season, that there are a number of studies that are indicating that use of probiotics um, is a really sensible and, 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 and good pro uh, protection against upper respiratory tract infections. And again, some of the things that we talked about before, trying to knock down those numbers of days of illness, you know, missing school, those sorts of things work, um, are certainly shown in these studies that were, were looked at in this meta-analysis in the British Journal of Nutrition. So I think I'll stop there and uh, thank, uh, thank uh, Lucky Vitamin again for making these webinars uh, available and asking me, inviting me to be part of it today. So thank you for your attention. And uh, Derek, are there any questions? All right. Thanks, Don. Uh, yeah, we do have some questions. And uh, I'll start with um, this one. <clears throat> you may have touched on it a little bit already, so feel free to reference back to any of these slides that you, that you have. Um, someone was asking if there's any danger of too much elderberry use by adults uh, or kids. Yeah, you know, the, the, the main symptom, the main side effects, that's a very good question, by the way. Um, again, elderberry has been consumed in, in amounts, you know, quite, quite large. Um, the main symptom that I found in people, and not everybody, is that there are some people who are, have a little bit more sensitive stomach, and so if they, you know, drink half of a bottle of Sambucas, they're likely to feel a lot of tightening in the stomach. And some people actually feel nauseous after doing that. But certainly no dangerous side effects, anything that would um, you know, cause any, any short-term or long-term harm. So in the, the studies that were done, at, at, at doses even slightly higher than what's recommended in the Sambuca, so really virtually no side effects. OK, great. Thank you. Uh, a customer is asking, should I be looking for organic or non-GMO certifications on elderberry products? Um, yeah, Nature's Way is actually uh, going to be putting the, they've done it with their green line, with their, you know, their, their single herb line, and they're moving to do that with other products, and the elderberry is, um, that's used in there is organic, and actually it's been a call out on the, on the Sambucas um, line for a while where they, they did come out with a organic line, but they'll have the non-GMO, you know, organic um, certification on them. Okay, great. Uh, well, another question, this one's about the Umka products. Which is the most effective delivery method of Umka? We have the liquids and the syrups, we have the hot beverage, we have the tablets. Uh, which one would you recommend? Um, you know, I put all of them on an equal basis because we spent a lot of time working with the uh, you know the, the the company that owns Nature's Way, Schwabe, um, in Germany, who is the largest uh, plant medicine company in the world, and uh, they had had the product out on the market, known in Germany as Umkala Wabo. Mercifully, uh, Nature's Way decided to call it Umk instead of Umkala Wabo. But um, we really uh, worked very hard in the new delivery forms to look at stability of the of the plant extract, and were and and would not put any of those particular you know, line extensions. So obviously, the traditional way that she's is in the alcohol-based drops. Um, but the common cold study was actually done with a cherry syrup that was virtually alcohol-free. So um, I'm very confident in, in, in the amount of active constituent is, that's in all those delivery forms and, and, and have been quite pleased to see that, that you know, they really do work a lot. I'm sort of a traditional guy, so if you said to me, what do you use when you start to get a common cold? I like the traditional drops. Okay. Thank you very much. So you had mentioned that there weren't any uh, known drug interactions with uh, elderberry or umca. Are, are there any known interactions with either drugs or supplements that may reduce the effectiveness of elderberry or umca? No, not that I'm aware of. No. Uh, and, and, and I have to say that while I say that with elderberry that hasn't been looked at too extensively, Sort of intuitively, I don't can't think of any medications that would inter, interfere with its actions. And uh, again, you know, the the primary one that we were concerned about initially with 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 Umka and the Pelargonium sedoides would be would be, hey, if you just, some kid does have to get antibiotics, let's say, you know, ends up with an ear infection, is taking Umka going to interfere with the antibiotic? And the answer seems to be no. There's been some fairly good studies that have actually shown that. Okay, great, thanks. 
Uh, that was all the questions that we have, so I'm going to wrap this up now. And I want to thank all of our customers for attending. And I want to thank Dr. Brown for taking time out of his busy schedule to help us with this webinar today. So, Dr. Brown, thank you very much. My pleasure. Thank you again for having me on. No problem. Okay, so if you have not already done so, please register for our upcoming webinars. For more information, please visit luckyvitamin.com and search the keyword webinar. Please see the screen for the exclusive promo code. And just a reminder, this code is active now and will be active for the next 72 hours. Thank you all for attending. We hope you enjoyed it. If you did, please tell a friend and help spread the wellness.